and according to what the scriptures, we would agree that what the scriptures would teach on that. And then the, the church really just morphed as time went on into full-blown what we call apostasy, just very terrible things that were done in the name of God in, in this period of time. And uh, so we, we've, we've already spent the time building that. It's all on YouTube. You can watch those sermons if you'd like. Um, but we just kind of build where, where the case for these trumpets connecting here, there, there's, there's a bunch of evidence in Scripture on this. And so really about the 1800s is when things really began to change, latter part of the 1700s into the 1800s, and we have kind of a new world order, a new, a new software, if you want to put it that way, that, that, that the culture is running, and that is secularism, evolution, whatever you want to call it, just, just this kind of godless, there's kind of an overreaction to this, you know, we have bad religion, so we just go to no religion, right? So, um, so I'm going to lay out this, the where we get this textually, it, not just, it doesn't just follow historically, it actually follows in the, in the train of, in, the, in the text here. Now, I'm not going to read these 12 verses, because it's a lot of imagery, a lot of stuff, it takes some time. Um, like I said, this is not, none of this is, it may seem in-depth, this is actually not that in-depth, okay? So, I would encourage you to, to read these things, study on your own, get Stefanovich's commentary, and you'll get a blessing out of it. But if we read these 12 verses, here's a summary of what you have here. We have a star falling from heaven. This star opens the bottomless pit, and smoke then comes out of the bottomless pit, and it covers the sun. And then these locusts come along that torment like humanity, and it's not literal locusts because they are literally wearing body armor. I kid you not. It says they're wearing like breastplates of armor, so there's no such thing as body armor wearing locusts. They just don't exist, so it's, it, it, this is symbolic imagery, and we'll unpack it here, okay? So these locusts come out, and by the way, locusts eat plants. Locusts don't attack people. They're not like mosquitoes where they go after you. They just eat up all your food, okay? Um, so the, but, but in Revelation here in chapter 9, the locusts actually torment men, you know, and, and so on. Um, it says the power of these locusts is in their tails, and then it says Sat Satan is their leader. If you use some interpretation there, it's, the names are actually referring to Satan that's referred to there. So that's in a nutshell. If you go through those 12 verses, that's what you see here, okay? So I want to unpack it just little by little, as you've seen in this series. The key to understanding this, which this has got to be, honestly, probably the most challenging stuff in all of, at least all of it in the New Testament, and probably all of Scripture. And so the key to understanding this correctly and not getting off into weird, wild speculation, crazy stuff that, that is just coming up out of thin air is to actually look and see where this imagery is found in other parts of Scripture, what does it mean, and then look at the spiritual application, and it starts to form a picture for us that makes some sense. And then especially as we do this throughout the book of Revelation, the bigger picture, it, it, the pieces all fit together. Does that make sense? All right, good, good. So star falling from heaven, what do you think that means? Somebody, that's not too hard, what does that mean? Where do you see, we actually looked in some of the other trumpets, a star falling from heaven. Do you have some biblical imagery of, what do stars mean when you see like in the book of Revelation when it says the seven stars in Revelation chapter one, the seven stars which you saw are seven, anybody remember? Angels, right? So that's pretty clear imagery there. So when you have an angel or star falling from heaven, who might that be referring to? Lucifer, right, obviously, right? This is in... Uh, in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning, you know, from heaven. So that one's pretty, see, kind of easy to understand there. Okay, it's obviously talking about Lucifer. He comes down from heaven, and what does he do? He opens up the bottomless pit, or the abusos in the Greek. Now, there's a lot of verses on this, but I'll just give you two of them for reference here, Jude 6, 2 Peter 2, and verse 4. The abusos, or this bottomless pit in the New Testament, is this sort of a symbolic imagery of like the, the abode, like an evil place, like the abode of demons, you know, where I don't think it's a literal place where like, you know, these demons are hanging out and they're, you know, locked in a cage, but it just means like, a, like a, it's, a, it's a symbolic representation of an evil place where, where demons are, are hanging out. So you don't want to be there, okay? So star falling from heaven, he opens up this kind of this abode of demons, and, and, and then this smoke comes out, like, like this demonic plague, you know, comes out here, and it covers the sun. Now, we looked at some imagery actually in the fourth uh, trumpet last week, 
where we looked at the sun, the stars, the moon, those things that give light, and there was a partial obscuring of those forms of light in the fourth plague, well, or fourth trumpet, and we get to the fifth trumpet, and it's just, it's not partial, it's full, okay? It, it, it just, it turns dark, so there's a blotting out of the sun. What do you think the sun, or giving light in this world, might represent? Well, yeah, let me give you a few verses here. Uh, Malachi 4 and verse 2, it's an Old Testament reference. It says, but for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. Let's look at, this is from New Testament uh, uh, era. This is Jesus speaking, John chapter 8. He says, I am the light of the world. I never thought of it this way before as I looked at this, but actually what physically gives light to the world? The sun does, right? The reason you could, we could turn the lights out here and still see each other, but we couldn't do it in 12 hours is because the sun is out. The sun literally gives light to the world, okay? So Jesus, spiritually speaking, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. This is another example. This is Psalm 119, uh, verse 30. It says, the unfolding of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple, okay? So light in, in, in scripture or the sun or the moon at times or stars, can uh, th these, these things that give light can be a symbol of spiritual truth, the gospel, Jesus, spiritual enlightenment, so on. So think of it this way, as this, as this star, as Satan falling from heaven, it opens up this bottomless pit where, the, you know, the, the, this, this, where these demons are. And, and then there's this, there's this where, where before this, there was this partial obscuring through this era of apostasy, right? Because apostasy changes the way we view God. And so it kind of obscures his character. You can see him, but it's not fully clear. When we get to this one, it's just boom, kind of blotted out, right? That's what, if you've ever seen like a real smoky day, you can't see very well because it, it covers. There may be some light coming through, but, but not really here, okay? So uh, this, is, this is about spiritual darkness, bringing spiritual darkness upon the world. So kind of broke up those three there. Now I want to go to the last three and, and unpack this imagery here. Okay, so locusts. Um, tormenting those who don't have the seal of God, okay? So locusts are just a common biblical symbol for judgment. I gave you some verses there, but there's a lot of verses we could go into. Actually, if you look at the, the, the exact wording of, of Revelation 9 that we're looking at here and in Joel 2, that's really the parallel passage, but I'm not going to go there for the sake of time. But just look at it big picture this way, that locusts are a symbol of I, I, or put it this way, when God's people were unfaithful to the covenant, then part of the judgment upon them or the punishment was, you know, multiple things will happen and one of them, locusts will come and eat up your crops, okay? So that's kind of the, the background here. And so I'm going to quote uh, Dr. Stefanovic here, and I agree with his interpretation on this. He says, the fact that the locust of the fifth trumpet come out from the abyss the prison abode of the demonic forces suggests that they are symbols. Remember, they're not literal, right? They're wearing body armor and they're attacking people. That's not real locusts, okay? That they are symbols of demonic forces which were temporarily confined and are now unleashed to do their harmful work. Okay, now notice some group of people on earth, though, are protected from this. And it says those that have God's seal. All right, we're going to get to this in a moment. I'm not going to go there now. And then it says that these locusts, or this, this symbolic representation of this, uh, of, of this demonic action that is, that is darkening the truth, the spiritual light that would come upon the world through Christ is darkening this. People can't see it, and so therefore they're tormented because of this. It says that, that they're, the power is in their tails. Now, what does that mean? Symbolize. I'm going to give you just two verses here on this. This is from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 13. <clears throat> it's a similar situation when God's people in the Old Testament had been unfaithful and been led astray by false prophets, and therefore they were suffering because of that, the consequences of that, okay? So this is Isaiah 3, or excuse me, 9, verses, verse 13. It says, But the people have not returned to him, nor have they sought the Lord Almighty. So the Lord will cut off Israel, both head and tail. And then it tells us what that imagery means, okay? The elders and the dignitaries, otherwise the, the leaders of the people, like we would say the head of state, you know, today, well, that's the head. And the prophets who teach lies are the tail, okay? So um, 
those that are reinforcing this. I, I, I would look at it, I, just had, I didn't have this in my study, but I just had this thought now, I would put it this way. We might say like that, the, if we were to look at a context today, the leaders of the country that are leading people astray are the head and like the media and the educa higher education and so on are teaching or maybe the entertainment industry are the ones like, like the false prophets teaching lies. Get it? It's kind of like a similar kind of parallel, right? So where you have those that have actual control, like, like leaders who have, they say do this and things happen, but then you have others that are intellectual influencers, okay? And so that's what these false prophets were, like the intellectual influencers. They, they weren't the leaders telling people. They were the ones saying, oh, everything's fine. You know, build this thing to Baal. God loves that. That's totally cool. You know, no, it's not. That's a false prophet. That's lying, okay? And so when we have this sim symbolism of the tail, there's a symbol, I think, a deeper symbol of this in, in Scripture of false persuasion in spiritual things. Does it make sense? Okay, like, like, like a false prophet. Now, who is the original, original, original false prophet? Satan, right? He's the original one that says, hey, I got some spiritual knowledge I want to share with you. I've got a way of seeing things, and I want you to follow what I say, and it's the truth. And yeah, he's the original false prophet, and the same imagery is used of him in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. It says he, in the context there's the dragon, the dragon's tail swept a third of the stars or a third of the angels out of the sky and flung them to the earth. So he got this started up in heaven with his slander of God and his false falsehoods, right? And then that, that, that had a persuasive effect on, on a third of, of God's angels, okay? So now that pretty much unpacks the imagery there of, um, of, of the fifth trumpet here in verses... 1 through 12 of Revelation 9. All right, so let's just kind of put it all together. We've kind of dissected it piece by piece real quick. Let's put it all together and then talk about what it means for you and me today because it means a lot. It means a lot. All right, so star falling from heaven, Lucifer, right? Uh, he opens up the bottomless pit, this demonic abode. Out comes this, this smoke that covers the sun. There's this obscuring of spiritual truth that comes in this time period. Um, the locust, you know, the sim symbolic uh, tormenting of, of people that, that don't have God's seal, and we're going to get there in a minute. Powers in their tails is false teachings about God, and, and it says Satan ultimately is, is their leader. Now, if you look historically of this, and we see what happened at the end of the, of the era of when the church was so dominant, you know, but but we would look back now and say that the church wasn't teaching what was true, okay? But it was, it was the dominant, do what we say, we'll burn you at the stake. And everybody, oh, you know, you're going to keep me out of heaven. We'll, we'll banish you from heaven if you don't give us money or something like that. It's just really keeping people in darkness and superstition. And then people turn away from that, and then they go to the other extreme, to where it's this godlessness, religion is bad, all of this, and it ultimately comes down to it's a satanic plague that is obscuring the gospel, and it causes great torment to people, okay? Now, this is Stefanovic's uh, interpretation. I agree with him. He says, thus, he went through a lot of the stuff I just went through. Thus, the fifth trumpet refers to the spiritual condition in the secular world and the consequences of such conditions from the 18th century to our time today. So bottom line, I would summarize it this way. We are living in this time being described. This is the worldview of the culture that, that we live in. We're, we're living in the time of the fifth trump trumpet. Society is being radically reconstructed. This is important to know. Because if you don't, if you, if you trust somebody that's lying to you, that's a big problem. Don't you agree? But if you have, but if you have a suspicion of someone that's lying to you, you're much better off, right? Because you're going to go, well, I don't know if I believe this guy or not, so I'm going to really test what I'm being told and so on. But if you have a high level of confidence in someone that is not, tr you know, that has ulterior motives, isn't telling the truth, that can really damage your life, okay? So we need to, I think, understand this, that 
the ideas of the world, this doesn't just come out of nowhere. Society's being radically reconstructed. I'll give some examples of this in a minute. This is bringing deep pain and suffering within humanity. And then obedience to the law of God is our only protector from this. Okay, let me sum it up this way. Since the collapse of Catholicism slash Protestantism as the dominant ideology, okay, that was about the 19th century. Now, keep in mind, when I say the 19th, that's the 1800s. Th that's when things really began to change at the more intellectual level. But it takes a long time for things to percolate down to the everyday Joe like you and I on the street. Okay. So the way society changes is you have elite learning centers, elite universities, like Harvard or Yale or... In Britain, it would be like Cambridge and Oxford and so on. So you have these, these elite, quote unquote, centers of education. And then students go to these schools and they are taught certain things. And then they, those ideas then percolate through the university system. Okay, and, and it's sort of like you go down like the first tier, second tier, third tier, and so then these ideas are taught, and then you eventually get down to state colleges and so on. And so things begin to change at the university levels first. And so, an, so you have a kind of an educated, quote unquote, class who may think a certain way. So like 100 years ago, educated people really didn't believe the Bible was really true, but, but you know, regular old people on the street, most people still had a reverence for the Bible and so on took time for this to really get down to the regular everyday folk. And that happens through education because these teachers in the elementary schools and middle schools and all are learning from professors who learn from professors who learn from professors and it goes all the way up. Also through the media and through just popular entertainment, these ideas are, are shared. And so what it does is it creates a false reality for people. You can see how rapid change can come in. I'll give an example. I don't know if I should give this example because these are sensitive issues and I, I'm going to touch on the issue in a minute, but I don't want to be, whenever we're dealing with things on a micro, a micro level about individual people or a macro level. So let's say I talk about an issue like, say, divorce on a macro level, the impact of the sexual revolution and divorce on society. And I talk about that on a big picture level. Well, there's people here are like, well, you know, maybe I slept around back in the day or maybe I got divorced or different. You know, we're talking micro. So I always want to be careful that I'm not insensitive to people on particular issues when you go macro on things, but I want to go macro on something that I think we all can relate to. If you look in just, our, just in my lifetime, and I still think I'm fairly young, maybe I'm wrong, but I still feel kind of young, um, huge change in sexual orientation and so on, bam, just incredible change, incredible change in, in a life in just 10 years, 15 years. And actually Joe Biden, remember Joe Biden, vice president back in last administration, he said, well, what really changed our minds was will and grace. That's what changed, right. So he's admitting there that there's, so, so there's an enter, entertainment can change the way you think about things. So do you see how you can have some pretty radical re-engineering of people's thinking in a very short period of time when you have um, universities on board with something and popular media and, and so on, it, it can just, especially when you have young people coming up today that just marinate on this stuff, you know, watch movies and television and videos and so on, it changes the thinking, it gets people to think things in a, in a certain way. And this is nothing new. The Nazis were masters at this. Anybody ever heard of Joseph Goebbels? master propagandists for the Nazis. The Nazis put out movies. You can watch these movies on YouTube. They're very persuasive. It tells an ideological agenda behind them, okay? So um, when Christianity is just kind of banished from the mind in the culture, then all of these new competing political slash social, even almost religious ideologies come in. I, I saw a speech from Hitler on YouTube once, and they were translating in the English, and, and they had scenes like this. I mean, this is not just having a pretty parade. There's a lot of ideology behind this, okay? You're trying to create a new social order when you're doing stuff like this. And he actually taught, was, Hitler was giving this speech, you know, and I can't speak German, but it was very passionate what he was saying. And, and, and they had these subtitles, and he said, creating a new order 
almost a new religious holy order. That's what he said, right? So when you have the bad Christianity that goes on for a long time, people dump that. Well, you've got to have some kind of framework in which to run a society or else everybody chooses their own and, that, and it's chaos. And so Hitler had an idea and the Nazis and fascism is broader than just Hitler, but they had some ideas about how to reconstruct society in a radical way and that all just fell apart. You know, you got Lenin here with communism. That's another idea about how to radically reconstruct society in various ways. Now, this is largely historical. I don't think there's probably any Nazis in here or any full-on com communist, right? Because this, this, that's kind of history to a large degree. Is it happening today, though? Yeah, it is happening today. There's major attempts to reorient the way people think about things and to reorient society. And I'll break it down a little bit as we go, okay? Deep changes are being uh, proposed and also pretty hardcore sanctions on people. You can lose your job if you, you know, post something on Facebook or something that you shouldn't post and so on. So, and I'm not, I want to be clear on this. Like, I'm not trying to make moral equivalence of things on all, all that list I just showed. What I'm just simply trying to point out is that we are in this time of the fifth trumpet and there is radical re attempts at reorienting society in a certain way for people to think a certain way. And we need to understand that is happening or else we just suddenly go along with it, you know? The Christians just kind of went along with Hitler because it kind of made sense. And you know what? And there was a certain truth to it, by the way. The Germans had a bad break at the end of World War I. I've studied that out. I can see why they were mad. It's understandable why they were mad. They just also gone through a horrible war. A lot of people had died in this First World War. Hitler comes along and says, you know what? We are victims. And everybody says, yes, we are. And you're speaking my language, okay? But then that, so he takes a certain truth and then that morphs and it goes way out of control, okay? And so like communism, you have, you had people at the bottom, extremely poor, people at the top, extremely rich, and people come along and say, this is bad, this isn't good, and guess what? There's a truth to that. So we're gonna radically reorient society and take this way further than it needs to go and actually becomes destructive. Same thing today with <clears throat> different concepts. <laughs> whether we're talking feminism or we're talking other types of ways of just radically, or on its radical form, reorienting the way we relate to one another as humans, the way people relate to each other, the way men and women relate to each other in the home, the way children relate to the parents, parents to the children, the way teachers relate to kids and kids' teachers, the way humans relate sexually to each other, all of this radical reorienting, okay? I'm not saying people aren't, have a sincerity of trying to make corrections. Such, I'll give an example of feminism. I think there was some validity to the, in the early movement to where there has, things needed to change on that. But then you get a radical reorientation of things, okay, that goes so far that it actually has a detrimental impact on, on society. So let me just break this down this way, the way I see it, okay? This radical social re-engineering with Nazism, it was just radical nationalism, you know? Essentially, an inter-European race war was what that is. It wasn't just the Germans. It was Croatians and Serbs and people just killing each other, Poles and Ukrainians. It just was, it, it was this radical nationalism that, that came in, uh, kind of kind of rising up again today in the world. Uh, with communism, uh, economic slash social, it, communism wasn't just an economic theory, but there was a lot of social theory behind it as well. Um, and then today, what we might call postmodernism, whatever you would call the far left, I would just say it's a, it's a radical attempt at social re-engineering of society. And we need to be aware of this so that we're not subtly going along with this because it says in the text we just read that this torments people, okay? Adopting these ideas don't lead individuals and don't lead societies to being better off, okay? So who's protected during this time? This is verse four of Revelation nine. It says they were told, the locusts, not to harm the grass of the earth, any plant or tree. We've already studied this and I've shown that that's a symbol used throughout scripture of God's people, okay? 
but, but who? God's people. Like half the world says I'm Christian. Is, it, is that what it's talking about? It says only those are harmed who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. This takes us back to Revelation chapter 7 with the, remember the seal of God, the sealing of the 144,000 and so on. Ephesians 1 gives us what the seal is. When you believe, you were marked with him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now, what does that lead to? If, I, if we're filled with the Spirit, does that lead to huge levels of excitement running around? Or what does that really lead to if you're filled with the Spirit? We'll get a biblical answer here. Ezekiel 36, it says, I will put my Spirit in you, and then here's going to be the outcome of the Spirit being inside of you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws, okay? So obedience to God, trusting him, not following what everybody else is doing and being faithful to him is what is the sign of the, of having the Holy Spirit or the seal of God planted on the inside. Now that has a specific manifestation in the last days we'll get to another day. But we can sum it up here in Revelation 14, 11. So those that are, have the seal of God aren't experiencing these, the horror of these things that this fifth trumpet's describing. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, right? Those two going together. I've got faith in Jesus, so I'm gonna keep the commandments. I am not gonna be goose-stepping Tommy fisting, marching and nothing. I'm just going to be humble and following Jesus is, is the attitude of people, right? And no matter what, what the next one is, because I could get on more. By the way, there, there's right wing versions of this too, <laughs> just on the left side, okay? I'm just having to blow through things quickly, but I just want you to see that, that the world's always, I wouldn't call it a flavor of the month because it isn't a month, but the world will typically have like a flavor of the 50 years, right? We're going to try this now until we've done this long enough to see, well, that didn't work out too well. Now we're going to try this and do this for about two or three generations. That didn't work out too well. If we're just anchored in Christ, following the scriptures, Jesus same yesterday, today, and forever, right? We don't have to just get drug along with whatever the new ideology is. It's going to make this world a better place, okay? It's just not, it's not our thing. <laughs> so as the world goes crazy, which I think it is, my humble opinion, the only protection is to trust and follow God's ways and God's laws. I want to point that out. Following God's commandments, not man's. It's more than just saying, I'm a Christian and I believe, and I don't, I don't, I don't like some of the stuff on TV. It's more than just that, having kind of a general sense of things. It's actually obeying and doing what he says, okay? following his ways and not, not the world's ways. That's our protection. Now, I'm going to give you a quotation or two. This is from Aldous Huxley. You ever heard of the Huxleys? Yeah, the Huxleys were like, a, like atheism was like a family business for the Huxleys. They were, back in the days of Charles Darwin, the, 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 the patriarch of the family was known as, was, uh, was Darwin's bulldog. He was, he was very, um, very, very strong passionate debater in favor of Darwinism, secularism, and so on. And these ideas actually, um, well, Darwin was British. And, and, and this kind of secular, the, 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 the kind of ideas that are, that are so dominant in our culture today really have their roots about 150 years ago in Britain. Okay, if you want to look where the, the genesis is and it kind of builds out from there. And one of those guys, one of the Huxleys, he made this statement. I thought of it as I was putting this together. Um, well, well, let me show you this one first, okay? He kind of gives his motive here. He says, we objected to the morality, meaning the old Christian morality. Now it's, it's the, the immorality is just mainstream now. But back then it was, you know, you're expected to behave yourself and not sleep around and, and get married and do all that, right? That was the expectation, not, not anymore. Um, to go back on this, I actually had a friend who was a pastor. He grew up in Adventist, so he grew up, you know, and he's, his dad was a pastor, and he's a pastor, so he's always been in, in uh, you know, in, in, in a different environment than the world, so to speak. And he said to me one time, he said, man, I had a moment that really made me realize 
I think our world is really messed up. So they were looking to adopt a child and the, um, the social worker who interviews you, right? You know, you got to get these interviews and they talk to you and you know, they want to make sure they're just giving a child to anybody. They asked them about their, their sexual history, both him and her. And they said, yeah, we've only been with each other. We got married and we've only been together. And that was like a red flag for this person. The person said, I have done, I have had these interviews with like hundreds of people and no one's ever told me that. So something's weird here. You guys are like weird. Something's up here. So the person was kind of like, I don't know about you guys a little bit, you know, like something's off here. So they had to convince this person, no, we're not like in some weird group or whatever. We're just like Christian people. And that's kind of how things went, you know? And he said, man, that really kind of opened my eyes to what's going on in the world, <laughs> you know? It's true. It's very, the, the world has radically changed from the time period that he's describing, okay? The morality he's, that Huxley's describing here. He says, we objected to that old Christian morality. Why? Why'd you do that? Why'd you do that, Aldous? Because it interfered with our sexual freedom. And justifying ourselves in our erotic revolt, we would deny that the world had any meaning whatever. Just, hey, if you see yourself as an animal, might as well behave like an animal. If you see yourself as a highly evolved animal, there's not really more, a moral element to it. Just, just do as you please. Now, he wrote this thing over 100 years ago. We've had a lot, many generations of this kind of thinking. But notice what, what he said, too, when, a little later in life. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you mad. Now he's using mad in the British kind of context, like crazy, not like we, I, I got mad the other day, right? That's more American. Mad to them, he's saying it like, the truth shall make you a madman or crazy, right? So it didn't, it's true, huh? it's true. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Lies will enslave us. It won't set us free, okay? All right, this is Proverbs 13, verse 15. It says, good understanding gives favor, but the way of transgressors is hard, All right? So that's where this, it says these, the, the, there's this torment that comes with this fifth, fifth uh, trumpet, you know? And I found this statement from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. I love this. It says, in obedience to God's law, Man is surrounded with a hedge and kept from evil. So do you want to be surrounded with a hedge and kept from evil? Here's how. Obedience to God's law, not having some ill-defined, you know, kind of quasi-religious sentiments. I kind of like church. You know, you want to go to church today? I don't know. I'm thinking about it. You, I don't know. No, obedience to God's law. It's a different mentality. What God says, I do, period. That kind of mentality okay, does something for us, right? Where, where we're approaching this not as a hobby, but as a deep commitment like a soldier has to a cause. That kind of commitment, okay? It says obedience to God's law, man is surrounded with a hedge and kept from evil. He who breaks down this divinely erected barrier at one point right? You don't, have to, you don't have to go full on and just say, I'm going to see if I can just do a hundred things to ruin my life. It can just be one. It can just be one. You steal from your boss once, you can lose your job. You can't say, oh, but I do everything else good. You see what I'm saying? This is important, right? It's important. You can ruin your marriage, ruin your job, ruin your life just on one point, okay? So he who breaks down this divinely erected barrier at one point has destroyed its power. This, this, this barrier of obedience has power to protect us, okay? For he has opened a way by which the enemy can enter to waste and ruin. Hey, if you're single, I wanna recommend a book to you, Choosing God's Best. Somebody gave me that book years ago when I was single. I read it, whoa, that blew my mind. It was a great book. It's about how messed up the whole dating culture is. In, in the world today, and it's damaging to people. 
So people enter marriages a lot of times very damaged of my generation, even baby boomer generation, my generation underneath, because there's been a lot of messed up ways of approaching relationships before that because of all this stuff. And so there's a lot of damage that has gone on and then, and then it, it creates a lot of pain and suffering and struggling. Check out Choosing God's Best or get it for somebody that's single. It's a great, great book. But the author of that book, I remember this so clearly, it was like, wow, bam, light went off in my head. That makes sense. Um, use the illustration of the law of God being like an umbrella, right? If we're, not, if we're not following the law of God, it's like we're out there in the rain just getting it beat down on us. Make sense? But with the law, we're covered, right? Stuff around us can be going haywire, but if we're obedient, we're protected, okay? This is what Jesus wants to do for all of us, y'all. This is what the devil wants to do. I love this contrast in this verse here. This is what the devil wants to do. This is what Jesus wants to do. The thief, that's the devil. That's, the, that's that angel coming down, popping open the, the pit and all the smoke coming out. That's him, okay? He's trying to obscure the truth. He's trying to obscure God's word so people can't see it and they run around doing foolish things because the culture's doing it and then it causes deep suffering and pain. So that's the thief. Here's what his agenda is. He comes only to steal he comes to steal this beauty God wants to do in your life. He wants to take it from you. He wants to kill and destroy the wonderful things that God wants to do for us and ultimately wants to take us out. But here's what Jesus said. He said, I came though that you, that we may have life and have it abundantly. Isn't that awesome? I don't want that taken from me, do you? No, the, the devil wants to steal and kill and destroy in my life. Jesus wants to give me a life that is more abundant than I could ever imagine, but I must be obedient to his word to receive that, okay? This is Paul writing, Colossians 2, verse 8. I would say this to all of us living in this world with all these ideas running around out here. See to it that no one takes you captive. Remember, these ideas bring slavery. Okay? That no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, which are based on human tradition. In other words, what everybody else thinks. Okay? And the spiritual forces of the world, whoosh, popping that pit open, now come the demonic forces, that stuff, <laughs> rather than on Christ. All right? Let me read it again. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, which are based on human tradition and the spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ, okay? Just keep looking to Jesus, follow his word. He's given us 10 commandments, they're real simple. So people say, oh man, the Bible, so many books, how do I know what to follow? Exodus chapter 20, you can just read those 10 right there and follow those, you'll be in good shape. Now, keep reading and learn some other things, and you, know, you can learn some great stuff and you know, applications in your life. But if you just want to know, hey, I want that hedge protection around me, there's 10 of them. There's one for each finger. You can, it's easy to make it memorize. I can do 10. I get confused if it gets bigger than that, but we can all do 10, right? We can all do 10. Here's my last verse. Where there is no revelation, or where, that, where, where, where it's darkened, the people cast off restraint. That's the culture we're living in today, casting off restraint. And there's consequences that are painful for that to our society, to our culture, and to us individually. But blessed is he who does what? Come on, church, don't be all wimpy about it. Blessed is he who? Keeps the law. There you go, keeps the law, amen. <laughs> Blessed is he who keeps the law, right? We live in an age where there's people are just casting off restraint. And we don't need to have a negative attitude toward people in this culture, by the way. I just want to get a little preachy on that for a minute. You know, Jesus didn't have a negative attitude about, the only people that I see Jesus having a negative attitude about when I read the gospels are the self-righteous people. He didn't seem to like them very much. He would speak pretty sternly to them but the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the people that were, you know, messing their lives up through sin, he didn't have this looking down on them attitude, right? 
was very compassionate toward these people. And the fact of the matter is we've been these people. Maybe, maybe still are these people. <laughs> I don't know. I hope not because it brings a lot of pain in the life. So here's the bottom line. I think we need to be the people that are saying, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have faith in God and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live that out and I'm going to do what the good Lord says and I'm going to see what Jesus does in my life and the healing he brings in my life and the, and the blessing he brings. And then all these people around me that are, are doing the cast off restraint thing and they're experiencing the pain that comes from this, I'm going to say, let me tell you about the healing I've found from all this pain and it's following Jesus and doing what he says. And people say, really? And we say, really? And let me tell you more about it. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That's all I got. That's the fifth trumpet. I guess I don't need to say any more, but I will. In all seriousness, especially to those that are young, if you're in high school, if you're in college, you're in a, you're in a world that's, that, that's really going to really come after you intellectually, okay? You may not be able to refute every argument. I can't, Satan's smarter than me and he's smarter than you. But you can follow Jesus and you can experience Jesus in your life, okay? And that testimony is all you need to have and all you need to know, okay? When the, when the blind man was, made, was, was blind and he got his eyesight back and they said, and they were, in, and they were saying, look, how did this happen? You were born blind. Tell us this. Tell us that. The guy finally said, I don't even know the answers to none of this stuff. I just know I used to be blind and now I can see. Amen. And Jesus did it, okay? You don't have to argue with people and have all the answers to all this stuff, right? These are complicated issues that I'm glossing over here. But at the end of the day, we can just simply know Jesus, have an experience with Jesus and say, I know Jesus. And if somebody's saying something that doesn't jive with Jesus, I just know that's wrong. And it ain't my job to create a big argument over it. It's just my job to do what God tells me to do. Amen? All right. Father, thank you so much that in this world where there is a, like a darkening of the gospel in, in our culture, in our wider culture, that the gospel light sh still shines brightly here upon those who are seeking you. I pray that would be all of us here, that we would seek you with all of our hearts and that we would find you and find the healing fountain that you give to the hurt and weary human soul. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. Bless us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.